You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy Monday evening, folks. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. And you can also come on over to the simulcast in video on my YouTube channel and join the live chat room that's going on right now during the show over at my YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, It's been a long few weeks. There's lots of current events, lots of political talk, and i got to tell you the truth, after a while that I get tired of that being all that I see. Now, that doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not things we should be engaged in uh, to one degree or the other. But after a while, it gets really old. Uh, This weekend, I... pretty much checked out of the news, um, only because I I was tired of reading the same things over again. If you're like me and you open up your social media streams, uh, I look at Facebook primarily uh, because I do, I put up uh, all kinds of advertising for this show, uh, for my art and all of that stuff, but I also put up all my family stuff, my pictures and work that I'm working on and things like that, but you scroll through that stream uh, to see what everybody else is talking about, and it's all focused around racism. It's all focused around the riots, which have diminished a bit, uh, thank goodness, Uh, but they're still out there. It's all focused around Black Lives Matter. It's all focused around all of this stuff that's going on right now. And uh, I have a belief that it's all in a build-up to the election. You're going to see it calm down after whatever happens in November, a few months from now. But all that being said, I have always said that this is not a political show, yet I found myself lapsing over into politics uh, because it's so pervasive right now what's going on. So I'm going to try, unless anything big comes up in current events, I'm going to try to steer us clear of talking about this stuff this week, even though I introduced the show this morning by mentioning it. But that's just by way of saying these are the things I don't want to get into this week. I think that there are other important topics to cover. And I know one of the things that has come up in all this discussion of racism and so on is America's past and what we have done in our past, the bad things we've done to the atrocious things we've done. And what seems to get buried is the good that we do as well and have done, the good that America has been in the world for the last 250 years. Even guys who were slaveholders, that doesn't define every facet of who they were or what they did, especially when owning slaves was part of international economics back then and the paradigm that existed. doesn't excuse it. It just says that we came out of that paradigm. That's what everybody is missing in the discussion. America is a wonderful place. And America really set the stage. Even the guys who owned slaves set the stage for America being the place where that would be abolished. Because it was inconsistent with our our origins. Inconsistent with who we are. And uh, so... There it is, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But along the way, there were lots of other things that took place. This might be something that gets latched on to by the racist movement, uh, the racist uh, uh, battling that's going on right now is what happened to the Native Americans. And I find that I am very staunchly in support of Native American issues. I look to the past and I say, I can't change the past. 
All I can do is live in the now with my fellow humans, my fellow Americans, my brothers and sisters of all different colors and races and creeds. And so I think it's important, however, to understand what happened to the Native American in this country. When we, as uh, uh, the United States, which formulated out of the colonies on the eastern seaboard, pushed them ever further west, and then we went way out west, and we pushed them ever further toward the center. <coughs> and this is a problem uh, of our past. And uh, it has really set up a people, when we established the reservations, uh, it set them up for failure. And uh, if you want to see a place where there was failure on the part of uh, the United States, it was in dealing with the Native Americans. Now, you can look way back in history, thousands of years, and say, I understand conquering and pillaging and overtaking, and, you know, Rome wouldn't have been what it was without it. Greece wouldn't have been what it was without it. Look at uh, Alexander the Great. He Hellenized the entire world. It means he made it Greek, uh, the entire world of, of commerce of the day. He didn't go, go over into China so far, but uh, you can see what he brought to the world, some very good things, international commerce, international language. Uh, yet he did this by going out and conquering and killing people, stealing their land from them. And so it is a matter of history. Would we do that now? No, we shouldn't do that now. But it's something that took place here in this country. And I think in understanding Native America, it's good to understand what happened to them, what their perspective is. And uh, I find, and I will just throw this in here anecdotally, um, there's been a lot of talk about Native American casinos that are on reservations, and that they as sovereign nations within our nation, under the jurisdiction of the federal government, they still have a right to have casinos where other cities and states cannot. And uh, I am all for it. I think this is one of the ways that the Native Americans have, uh, even though it's gambling and so on, casinos, all of that, it's a way that they have taken back a little bit. And they're profiting well from it. And I think more power to them. We'll get more into that as we get later into this series. I want to talk about that specifically and what I think about it and what's thought about it and how uh, the federal government or at least state governments are trying to shut them down or vote in uh, casinos so they can compete with them. I think leave it alone. There it is. It's good. But the state doesn't like it because the state doesn't own it. And it's owned by the Native American reservations and their culture and more power to them. And I think that there are places even here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area in the outskirts where we have reservations. There's one reservation and somebody, if they're from that reservation, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe it's the uh, uh, Prior Lake uh, out to the west of the cities uh, that they, every family that is part of that tribe gets $40,000 or thereabouts per month from the casinos. So it has benefited their community. They have a police force there that's the best paid police force in the world. And I don't know, the world, at least in our state. And uh, I don't think they're moving to disband their police, by the way. And so um, all that to say, that's off the top of my head. We'll dig into that a little deeper. and We'll get into some more detail about that. But today... I wanted to focus on, start focusing on different stories of different tribes uh, in the United States, in America, that were driven out by the United States. And I want you to see some of the real history. I'm, I, I am falling heavily on D. Brown's book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and there's other histories to look at. But remember, his book was written from the perspective of the Native American, how they viewed the westward expansion of the United States, and the conquering of the American West. And so I want to talk today a little bit about the long walk of the Navajo. And this is the first of one of many stories that we're going to cover. I have no idea how long this series will go, but uh, I think we'll go as long as there is new vital information to share with you. Uh, and maybe, and a lot of it isn't new, 
but a lot of it may be history that you haven't heard before from a different perspective, from the perspective of those who were trounced by history. And history was written, of course. We grew up in schools and we heard that there was the westward expansion, but and we hear all of these different uh, atrocities that were committed against the Native Americans that were listed as the battle of this or the battle of that. Uh, it's like uh, we talked about last September when we, when we focused on Wounded Knee, the Battle of Wounded Knee. It wasn't a battle at all. It was the U.S. Cavalry opening fire on a bunch of innocent men, women, and children. Uh, that's not a battle. Uh, and so I thought it would be good for us to look at some of the stories. And in 1860, March 12th to be exact, the U.S. Congress passed the preemption bill. And this provided free land to settlers in the Western territories. April 3rd, First Pony Express leaves St. Joseph, Missouri. It delivers letters to Sacramento, California on the 13th of April. April 23rd, the Democratic National Convention at Charleston, South Carolina, divided on the slave issue. And May 16th through 18th, the Republican National Convention in Chicago nominated Abraham Lincoln for president. June, the population of the U.S. reaches 31 million 443,000 and some odd stragglers on. <coughs> In July this of that same year, 1860, the Spencer repeating rifle was invented. November 6th, Abraham Lincoln receives only 40% of the popular vote, but he wins the presidency. Only 40%. I just like to say, with all the squalor about uh, squalling and screeing and caterwauling about Donald Trump, uh, he won, I think, uh, 49% of the popular vote. So uh, Lincoln won 40% of the popular vote. On December 20th of that year, South Carolina seceded from the Union. Now in 1861, a few months later, February 2nd, the Confederate Congress organized at Montgomery, Alabama. February 9th, Jefferson Davis was elected the President of the Confederate States. February 11th, Abraham Lincoln says farewell to friends and neighbors at Springfield, Illinois, and leaves by train for Washington, D.C. And in March, President Davis asks for 100,000 soldiers to defend the Confederacy. By April 12th, the Confederates open fire on Fort Sumter. And April 14th, Fort Sumter falls. April 15th, President Lincoln calls for 70,000 volunteer soldiers. Uh, July 21st, the first Battle of Bull Run. The Union Army falls back on Washington. October 6th, rioting Russian students close down the University of St. Petersburg. October 25th, the Pacific Telegraph Line between St. Louis and San Francisco is completed. December 5th, Gatling gun is patented. Uh, December 14th, British mourn the death of Albert, Prince Consort of Queen Victoria, and December 30th, the U.S. banks suspend gold payments. <coughs> now, all of this history is by way of telling you this is what was going on in uh, 1860 and 1861. Of course, a lot of other world events, but primarily in the United States, this was going on with a few major events around the world. Now, Manuelito of the Navajo said this, When our fathers lived, they heard that the Americans were coming across the great river westward. This would be the Mississippi. We heard of guns and powder and lead, first flintlocks, then percussion caps, and now repeating rifles. We first saw the Americans at Cottonwood, Washington. We had wars with the Mexicans and the Pueblos. We captured mules from the Mexicans and had many mules. The Americans came to trade with us. And when the Americans first came, we had a big dance. And they danced with our women. We also traded. That was Man Man uh, Manuelito. So Manuelito and other Navajo leaders made treaties with the Americans. Then the soldiers, and this is a quote, then the soldiers built the fort here, Manuelito remembered, and they gave us an agent who advised us to behave well. He told us to live peaceably with the whites, to keep our promises. 
They wrote down the promises so that we would always remember them. And uh, Manuelito, he tried to keep the promises in the treaty. But after the soldiers came and burned his hogans and killed his livestock because of something a few wild young Navajos had done, he grew angry at the Americans. He and his band had been wealthy, but the soldiers had made them poor. Uh, to become ricos again, they had to raid Mexicans to the south, and for this the Mexicans called them ladrones, or thieves. As for long as anyone could remember, the Mexicans had been raiding Navajos to steal their young children, make them slaves. And as for as long as anyone could remember, the Navajos had been retaliating with raids against the Mexicans. And so after the Americans came to Santa Fe and called the country New Mexico, they protected the Mexicans because they'd become American citizens. And the Navajos were not citizens because they were Indians. And when they raided the Mexicans, soldiers would come rushing into the Navajo country to punish them as outlaws. And this was all an angry puzzle to Manuelito and his people, for they knew that many of the Mexicans had Indian blood, and yet no soldiers ever went rushing after the Mexicans for punishing them for stealing Navajo children and impressing them into slavery. The first fort the Americans built in Navajo country was in a grassy valley at the mouth of Canyon Bonito, and they called it Fort Defiance. And they put their house, horses out to graze on pasture land, long prized by Manuelito and his people. And the soldier chief told the Navajos that the pastures belonged to the fort and ordered them to keep their animals away from the fort's pasture land. <clears throat> because there was no fencing, the Navajos couldn't prevent their livestock from straying onto the forbidden meadows. And one morning, a company of mounted soldiers rode out of the fort and shot all of the animals belonging to the Navajo because their livestock had wandered onto what the fort was now claiming was their land for grazing their horses. So to replace their horses and mules, the Navajos raided the soldiers' herds and supply trains. This was pretty common throughout centuries amongst Native Americans. And the soldiers in turn began attacking the bands of Navajo. And in February of 1860... Manuelito led 500 warriors, 500 of them, against the army's horse herd, which was grazing a few miles north of Fort Defiance. The Navajo lances and arrows were no match for the well-armed soldier guard, and they suffered more than 30 casualties, but captured only a few horses in the process. And uh, during the following weeks, Manuelito and his army, a Barbancito, built up a force of more than a thousand warriors. And in the darkness of the early hours of April 30th of 1860, they surrounded Fort Defiance. Two hours before dawn, the Navajo attacked the fort from three sides. They were determined to wipe it off the face of their land, and they came very near to succeeding at this. With a rattle of fire from their few old Spanish guns, the Navajo drove in the sentries and overran several buildings, and then, as uh, startled soldiers poured from the barracks, they met showers of arrows. But after several minutes of confusion, the soldiers formed files and soon commenced a steady musket fire. And when daylight came, the Navajo pulled back into the hills, satisfied that they'd taught the soldiers a pretty good lesson. Don't fuck with us. And don't kill our livestock. <clears throat> now, the United States Army, however considered the attack a challenge of the flag over Fort Defiance and an act of war. It wasn't a war. It was skirmishing over livestock and grazing land. And now a few weeks later, Colonel Edward Richard Sprigg Canby, at the head of six companies of cavalry and nine of infantry, was scouring the Chuska Mountains in search of Manuelito's hostiles. And the troops marched through the Red Rock country until they wore out their horses and almost died of thirst. And although they seldom saw any Navajo, the Indians were there. They were harassing the column's flanks, but making no direct attacks. And by the end of the year, both sides grew weary of the foolish game. The soldiers were unable to punish the Navajo, and the Navajo were unable to attend their crops and their livestock. So in January of 1861... 
Manuelito, Barbancito, Herrero Grande, Armijo, Delegalito, Del Delgadito, and other Rico leaders agreed to meet Colonel Canby at a new fort the soldiers were building 35 miles southeast of Fort Defiance. The new fort was called Fort Fontleroy in honor of a soldier chief. And at the end of the parleys with Canby, the Navajo chose Herrero Grande as head chief. This was on February 21st of 1861. Now, mind you, all that history we read of what's going on in the United States, this is happening down in the Southwest at the same time. Same time Abraham Lincoln is being um, uh, declared the, uh, the nominee for the Republican Party. Um, this was going on in the Southeast or Southwest. And the leaders agreed that it was best to live in peace and Herrero Grande promised to drive all ladrones from the land and from the tribe. So Manuelito wasn't sure what this promise would, would be and how it would be carried out, but he signed his name to Canby's paper. And a prosperous stock raiser again, he believed in the virtues of peace and honesty. <clears throat> now, after the winter meeting at Fort Fauntleroy, there were several months of friendship between the soldiers and the Navajo. And rumors reached the Indians of a big war somewhere far to the east, the Civil War, between the north and south of the United States. And they learned that some of Canby's soldiers had exchanged their blue coats for gray coats and gone east to fight against the blue coat soldiers there. One of them was Chief Eagle Chief uh, Colonel Thomas Fauntleroy. He was a colonel. And his name was blotted out. And now they called the, por uh, the, the post uh, Fort Wingate because Fauntleroy could no longer bear the name of a Union fort and uh, because he was fighting for the Confederacy. And in this time of friendship, the Navajos went off, often to, to Fort Fauntleroy, to Wingate, uh, to trade and draw rations from their agent. And by the way, this renaming of that fort, you can almost look at it as what the rioters want to do with renaming everything nowadays. Although, uh, this was the army that renamed its fort because one of its own went to the south, and so they, they wanted to wipe his name off of the fort. And so it's been done through history before. So most of the soldiers made them welcome, uh, the Navajo, and a custom grew up of having horse races between the Navajo and the soldiers. And all the Navajo looked forward to these contests, and on racing days, hundreds of men, women, and children would dress in their brightest costumes, and they'd ride their finest ponies to Fort Wingate. And on a crisp, sunny morning in September, several races were run, but the special race of the day was scheduled at noon. It was between Pistol Bullet, a name given Manuelito by the soldiers, and on a Navajo pony, and a lieutenant on a quarter horse. <clears throat> Many bets were made on this race. Money, blankets, livestock, beads, whatever a man had to use for a bet. And the horses jumped off together. But in a few seconds, everyone could see the pistol bullet Manuelito was in trouble. He lost control of his pony, and it ran off the track. And soon everyone knew that pistol bullet's bridle rein had been slashed with a knife. The Navajo went to the judges, who were all soldiers, and demanded that the race be run again. The judges refused. They declared the lieutenant's quarter horse was the winner. <clears throat> Immediately, the soldiers formed a victory parade for a march into the fort to collect their bets. And infuriated by this chicanery, this trickery, the Navajo stormed after them. Now, the, the fort's gates were slammed shut in their faces, but when a Navajo attempted to force entrance, a sentinel shot him dead. This is all arguing over this race. And what happened next was written down by a white soldier chief, Capital Nickel, I'm sorry, Captain uh, Nicholas Hodd, and the Navajo squaws, he said. And the children ran in all directions. They were shot, and they were bayoneted. And I succeeded in forming about 20 men. I then marched out to the east of the post. There I saw a soldier murdering two little children and women. And I hallooed immediately to the soldier to stop. He looked up, but he didn't obey my order. I ran up as quick as I could but could not get there soon enough to prevent him from killing these two innocent children and wounding severely the squaw. 
Now, this is in his own words. i got to stop there because we're at the end of the first segment of this show. We're going to pick up with this story when we come back. Sit tight. Looking for a really awesome and amazing graphic designer? How about an illustrator or a photographer? This is Rainy Roberts, and I wanted to tell you how you can get my designer, illustrator husband, Scotty Roberts, to work for you on your project. Do you have an awesome self-published book but no cover, or even worse, a cover that really sucks? Do you need a kick-ass logo for your company or some f***ing awesome graphic designs for your ads or website? Then get in touch with my husband for the best f***ing awesome kick-ass design and illustration he knows his stuff and he's been at this for more years than i've been alive go to scottallenroberts.com that's scott with two t's a-l-a-n-r-o-b-e-r-t-s.com to take a look at his online portfolio of work or call 651-468-8115 now go out and kick some ass with some kick-ass graphic design hi i'm my dad so he can take me to disneyland All right, folks, thanks for sitting on through that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. You're also watching the simulcast and video, and I hope joining the live chat room that's going on right now over on my YouTube page. That's YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Now, I want to jump right back into this because we left before the break on a story uh, that was, it's the story of the Navajo, but there's a particular account that was written by Captain Nicholas Hunt, and this is an event that took place while the Navajo would customarily come to the fort and they would race horses, and it was a big gathering. It was almost like a powwow, so to speak, and... Uh, <clears throat> So there had been a lot of bets placed on the leader of the Navajo, Manuelito, and uh, um, a, uh, a captain who was riding a quarter horse. This race was heavily bet on. And Manuelito lost the race because he lost control of his pony and, uh, and found out that the reins had been cut with a knife. And so he went and protested. The judges wouldn't hear him out. The judges were all members of the U.S. Cavalry. And they all went cheering and parading, all went in to collect on their bets inside the fort, but they closed out the Navajo, who were a little pissed off by this, as you can uh, rightfully understand. And uh, when a Navajo attempted to force an entrance to the fort, uh, he was shot dead by one of the sentries. Way out of line. And so uh, what happened next, this was the account that was written down by Nicholas Holt. And uh, the women and children were running in all directions. They they were being shot. They were being bayoneted. And uh, this uh, um, Captain Nicholas Hot O D T H O D T had written down this account. <clears throat> and we ended the last segment where he said uh, uh, there was uh, a, he saw a soldier murdering two little children and a woman, Navajo children and women. 
and he hallooed immediately to the soldier to stop. <clears throat> These women and children weren't part of the race and the betting. And he looked up this soldier, but didn't obey the order of the captain. And so the captain ran up as quick as he could, but could not get there soon enough to prevent this soldier from killing the two innocent children and wounding severely the woman. I ordered his belts to be taken off and taken prisoner to the post. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the colonel had given orders to the officer of the day to have the artillery, the mountain howitzers, brought out to open up upon the, on the Indians. The sergeant in charge of the mountain howitzers pretended not to understand the order given, for he considered it an unlawful order. Good for him. But being cursed by the officer of the day and threatened, he had to execute the order or else get himself in trouble. The Indians scattered all over the valley below the post, attacked the post herd, wounded the Mexican herder, but did not succeed in getting any stock. They also attacked the expressman some ten miles from the post, took his horse and mailbag, and wounded him in the arm. After the massacre, there were no more Indians to be seen about the post, with the exception of a few squaws, favorites of the officers. And the commanding officer endeavored to make peace again with the Navajo by sending some of the favorite squaws to talk to the chief. But the only satisfaction the squaws received was a good flogging. After that day, September 22nd of 1861, it was a long time before there was friendship again between the white men and the Navajo, as you can well imagine. Meanwhile, an army of... Con being mowed down by a howitzer over a horse race. So meanwhile, an army of Confederate graycoats had marched into New Mexico and brought and fought big battles with the Bluecoats among the Rio Grande. Kit Carson, you remember that name, Kit Carson? Um, he was the rope thrower. Uh, he was the leader of the Bluecoats. Most of the Navajo trusted rope thrower Carson because he'd always talked one way to the Indians and they hoped to make peace with him when he was finished with the Greycoats. In the spring of 1862, however, more Bluecoats came marching into New Mexico from the west. They called themselves the California Column. Their general, James Carleton, wore stars on his shoulder and was more powerful than the Eagle Chief Carson, who was a colonel, Eagle Chief. And these Californians camped along the Rio Grande Valley, but they had nothing to do because the gray coats had all fled into Texas. And so the Navajo soon learned that Star Chief Carleton had a great hunger for their land and whatever metal wealth might be hidden underneath it. Gold. A princely realm, he called it, a magnificent pastoral and mineral country. And as he had many soldiers with nothing to do but march around their parade grounds, rattling their guns, Carlton began looking about for Indians to fight. And the Navajo, he said, were wolves that run through the mountains and, he, and must be subdued. So Carlton turned his attention first to the Mescalero Apaches, who numbered less than a thousand and lived in scattered bands between the Rio Grande and the Pecos, and his plan was to kill or capture all Mescaleros and then confine the survivors on a worthless reservation along the Pecos. And this would leave the Rio Grande Valley open for land claims and settlement by American citizens. And in September of 1862, he sent out an order. There's to be no council held with the Indians, nor any talks. The men are to be slain, whenever and wherever they can be found. The women and children may be taken as prisoners, but of course, they're not to be killed. Now, this was not Kit Carson's way of dealing with the Indians, many of whom he counted as friends from his trading days. And he sent his soldiers into the mountains but he also opened up lines of communication with them, with the Mescalero leaders. And uh, Kit Carson, they did uh, movies about him, and uh, uh, there was a television show, I believe, about Kit Carson uh, back in the 50s. And uh, I remember seeing it as a little kid in repeats, of course. I wasn't alive till 1960. But uh, Christopher Houston Carson 
Uh, he was known as Kit Carson, was an American frontiersman. He was a fur trapper. He's a wilderness guide, an Indian agent, and a U.S. Army officer. And he became a frontier legend in his own lifetime via biographies and news articles and exaggerated versions of his exploits that were the subject of dime novels. It was like the stuff of, uh, like, uh, Wild Bill Hickok, you know, and Bat Masterson and uh, Wyatt Earp and all of these guys in the American West, he had the same kind of a reputation uh, as being a, uh, uh, a legend in his own time in the Wild West. And he, understand, he understated, uh, his understated nature belied and confirmed reports of his fearlessness, his combat skills, his tenacity, his profound effect on the westward expansion of the United States. Although very famous for much of his life, historians in later years have written that Kit Carson did not like, want, or even fully understand the celebrity that he experienced in his life. And uh, he left his home in Missouri at age 16. He became a mountain man. He became a trapper in the West. In the 1830s, he accompanied Ewing Gregor. Uh, I'm sorry, Ewing... I don't know where I got Gregor from. Ewing Young. Uh, on an expedition to Mexican California. And he joined fur trapping expeditions into the Rocky Mountains. He lived among and married into the Arapaho and Cheyenne tribes. And in the 1840s, Carson was hired as a guide by John C. Fremont. Fremont's expeditions covered much of California and Oregon and the Great Basin area. And Fremont mapped and wrote reports and co on commentaries on the Oregon Trail to assist and encourage the westward-bound pioneers. And Carson achieved real national fame through these accounts. And under Fremont's command, Carson participated in the conquest of Mexican California at the beginning of Mexican-American War. And later in the war, Carson was a scout and a courier. And he celebrated for his rescue mission after the Battle of San Pascal and for his coast-to-coast -coast journey from California to Washington, D.C., to deliver news of the conflict in California to the government. And in the 1850s, he was appointed as the Indian agent to the Ute Indians in the Jacaria Mountains, and Jacaria probably is the way it's pronounced, Apaches. And uh, during the American Civil War, Carson led a regiment of mostly Hispanic volunteers from New Mexico on the side of the Union, at the Battle of Valverde in 1862. And when the Confederate threat was eliminated in New Mexico, Carson led forces to suppress the Navajo, uh, the Mescalero Apache, the Kiowa, the Comanche tribes. And he did this by destroying their food sources. He was breveted a brigadier general and took command of Fort Garland, Colorado. And he was there only briefly as, a, as poor health forced him to retire from military life. And Carson was married three times. He had ten children. He died at Fort Lyon in California of an aortic aneurysm. Heart attack of some kind. And on May 23rd of 1868, and he's buried in Taos, New Mexico, next to his third wife, um, Josepha. That's a little brief history of Kit Carson. And uh, you can look him up and uh, find out more about him. But he was a mountain man, he was an Indian trader, or, or an Indian agent, and he made a lot of friends amongst the Native Americans. And uh, so, uh, let's see, while en route to Santa Fe, two of the chiefs of their escorts, of Kit Carson's escorts, I'm sorry, uh, two of the chiefs of their escorts met a detachment of soldiers. And this was when, uh, in late autumn, five chiefs were sent to Santa Fe to negotiate with General Carleton. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was Kit Carson who had opened up the lines of communication with the Mescalero leaders. And uh, while en route to Santa Fe, two of the chiefs and their escorts met a detachment of soldiers under the command of a former saloon keeper, uh, Captain James Paddy Graydon. And Graydon pretended great friendship for the Mescaleros. He gave them flour and beef for their long journey. 
and a short time later near Galena Springs, Graydon's scouting party came upon the Mescaleros again, and what happened there isn't clear because no Mescalera survived the incident. A white soldier chief, Major Arthur Morrison, reported briefly, The transaction was very strangely committed by Captain Graydon, and for what I can learn, he deceived these Indians, going right into their camp, giving them liquor, afterwards shot them all down. They, of course, thinking him to come with friendly purposes as he'd given them flour and beef and provisions. Now, the other three chiefs, Cadet, Chato, and Estorella, reached Santa Fe and assured General Carleton that their people were at peace with the white men and wanted only to be left alone in their mountains. You are stronger than we, Cadet said. We have fought you so long as we have had rifles and powder, but your arms are better than ours. Give us like weapons and turn us loose and we'll fight you again. But we're worn out. We have no more heart. We have no more provisions, no means to live. Your troops are everywhere. Our springs and our water holes are either occupied or overlooked by your young men. You have driven us from our last and best stronghold, and we have no more heart. Do with us as may seem good to you, but do not forget we are men and braves. Now Carleton haughtily informed them that the only way the Mescaleros could achieve peace would be to leave their country and go to the Bosque Redondo. Remember I mentioned the Bosque Redondo before? The Bosque Redondo is the reservation that was given in perpetuity by treaty of the U.S. government to the tribes, and yet in the 1970s, it might have even been the late 60s, they discovered uranium, the largest deposit, I think it's the second large deposit on the continent, beneath the Bosque Redondo. And of course, ever since then, they tried to rescind those treaty rights. So he urged them to go to the Bosque Redondo and the reservation he'd prepared for them on the Picos. And there they would be kept in confinement by soldiers at a new military post called Fort Sumner. Now, outnumbered by the soldiers, unable to protect their women and children, and trusting in the goodwill of rope thrower Carson, Kit Carson, the Mescalero chiefs submitted to Carleton's demands and took their people into imprisonment on the Bosque Redondo. Now, with some uneasiness, the Navajo had been watching Carleton's quick and ruthless conquest of their cousins, the Mescalero Apaches, and in December. Eighteen of the Rico leaders, including Delgadito and Barbancito, but not Manuelito, traveled to Santa Fe to see the general. They told him that they represented peaceful Navajo herdsmen and farmers who wanted no war. This was the first time they had looked upon Star Chief Carlton. His face was hairy, his eyes were fierce, and his mouth was that of a man without humor. He did not smile when he told Delgado and the others, You can have no peace until you give other guarantees than your word that the peace should be kept. Go home and tell your people so. I have no faith in your promises. Is that the pot calling the kettle black or what? So now keep in mind, these Navajo are here to say, Look, we're, we're tired of war. We don't want this anymore. We just want to live in peace with our families and with our people. And already, what are they doing? They're negotiating for their survival on what used to be their land. So by the spring of 1863, this is, this is at the height of the Civil War out east, most of the Mescaleros had either fled to Mexico or been herded into the Bosque Redondo. And so in April, Carleton went to Fort Wingate to gather information for a campaign against the Navajo as soon as the grass starts sufficiently to support stock. And he arranged a meeting with Delgadito and Barbancito near Cubero, and bluntly informed the chiefs that the only way they could prove their peaceful intentions would be to take their people out of the Navajo country and join the contented Mescaleros, contented in quotation marks, at the Bosque Redondo. And to this, Barbancito replied, I will not go to the Bosque. I will never leave my country, not even if it means that I'll be killed. 
and on June 23rd, Carlton set a deadline for Navajo removal to the Bosque Redondo. Quote, send for Delgadito and Barbancito again, he instructed the commanding officer at Fort Wingate, and report, uh, repeat what I before told them, and tell them that I shall feel very sorry if they refuse to come in. Tell them they can, ha they can have until the 20th day of July of this year to come in. Uh, they and all those who belong to what they call the Peace Party. That after that day, every Navajo that is seen will be considered as hostile and treated accordingly. That after that day, the door now open will be closed. And the 20th of July came and went, but no Navajo volunteered to surrender. In the meantime, Carlton had ordered Kit Carson to march his troops from the Mescalero country to Fort Wingate, Wingate and to, to prepare for a war against the Navajo. Carson was incredibly reluctant to do this. He complained that he had volunteered to fight Confederate soldiers, not Indians, and he sent Carlton a letter of resignation. Kit Carson liked Indians. His friends were in the Indian tribes. In the old days, he'd lived with them for months at a time without seeing another white man. He had fathered a child by an Arapaho woman and had lived for a long time with a Cheyenne woman. But after he married Yosifa, the daughter of Don Francisco Yaramelo of Taos, Carson had taken new roads, grown prosperous, claimed land for a ranch. And he discovered that in New Mexico there was room at the top even for a rough, superstitious, illiterate mountain man such as himself. And he learned to read and write a few words, and although he was only five foot six inches tall, his name touched the sky. Famous as he was, the rope thrower never okay overcame his awe of the well-dressed, smooth-talking men at the top. In 1863, in New Mexico, the biggest man at the top was Star Chief Carlton. And so in the summer of that year, Kit Carson withdrew his resignation from the Army and went to Fort Wingate to take the field against the Navajo. Before the campaign was over, his reports to Carlton were echoing the manifest destiny presumptions of the arrogant man from whom he took his orders. The Navajo respected Carson as a fighter, but they had no use for his soldiers. The New Mexico volunteers, many of them were Mexicans, and the Navajos had been chasing them out of their country as long as anyone could remember. There were ten times as many Navajo as Mescalero, and they had the, the advantage of a vast, rugged terrain and country that was broken by deep canyons, steep bank arroyos, and a, uh, and, and, and a precipice-flanked mesa. And their stronghold was Canyon de Chile, uh, cutting westward for 30 miles from the Chusca Mountains, narrowing in some places to 50 yards. The canyon's red rock walls rose a thousand feet or more, with overhanging legends offering excellent defensive positions against invaders. And at points where the canyon widened to several hundred yards, the Navajo grazed sheep and goats on pasturage, or raised corn, wheat, fruit, and melons at cultivated soil and they were especially proud of their peach orchards. They carefully tended them since the days of the Spaniards. Water flowed plentifully through the canyon for most of the year, and there were enough cottonwood and box elder trees to supply wood for fuel. And even when they learned that Carson had marched a thousand soldiers to Pueblo, Colorado, and had hired his old friends the Utes to serve as trackers, the Navajo were still scornful. The chiefs reminded their people of how in the old days they had driven the Spaniards off of their land. And if the Americans come to take us, we will kill them, the chiefs promised. But they took precautions to secure the safety of their women and children. They knew the mercenary Utes would try to make captives of them for sale to wealthy Mexicans. And late in July, Kit Carson moved up to Fort Defiance, renamed it for the Indians' old adversary, Canby, and began sending out reconnaissance detachments. He was probably not very surprised that few Navajo could be found, and he knew that the only way to conquer them was to destroy their crops, 
and their livestock, scorched their earth, and on July 25th he sent Major Joseph Cummings to bring in all the livestock that could be found and to harvest or burn all corn or wheat along the Benito. And as soon as the Navajo discovered what Cummings was doing to their winter food supply, he became a marked man. And a short time later, a Navajo marksman shot him out of his saddle, killing him instantly. Boom! Headshot, 300 yards. They also raided Carson's Corral, near Fort Canby, recapturing some sheep and goats, and stole the rope thrower's favorite horse. So General Carlton was far more nettled by such incidents than Carson, who had lived with Indians long enough to appreciate the bold retorts. This is just what they did. This is how they worked. He wasn't so bothered by it. And on August 18th, the general decided to stimulate the zeal of his troops by posting prize money, prize money to soldiers for captured Navajo livestock. He offered to pay $20 for every sound serviceable horse or mule and $1 per head for sheep brought into the commissary at Fort Canby. And this is a lot of money for guys that made maybe two bucks a month in their day. And so as the soldier's pay was less than $20 per month, far less than $20 per month, the bounty offer did stimulate them, and some of the men extended it to the few Navajo they were able to kill. And so to prove their soldierly abilities, they began cutting off the knot of hair fastened by a red string which the Navajo wore on their heads. And the Navajo could not believe that Kit Carson condoned scalping which they considered a barbaric custom introduced by the Spaniards. And the Europeans may or may not have introduced scalping to the New World, but the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, and the English colonists made the custom popular by offering bounties for scalps of their respective enemies. And although Carson continued his steady destruction of grain fields, of bean and pumpkin patches, he was slowly moving uh, to suit General Carleton. In September, Carleton ordered that thenceforth every Navajo male was to be killed or taken prisoner on sight. And he wrote out for Carson the exact words he was to use to capture the Navajos. Quote, Say to them, Go to the Bosque Redondo or we will pursue and destroy you. We will not make peace with you on any other terms. This war shall be pursued against you if it takes years. Now that we have begun until you cease to exist or move, there can be no other talk on the subject. End of quote. About this same time, the general was writing the War Department headquarters in Washington, demanding an additional regiment of cavalry. More soldiers were needed, he said, because of a new gold strike not far west of the Navajo country, troops sufficient to whip the Indians and to protect the people going to and at the mines. Providence has indeed blessed us. The gold lies here at our feet to be had by the mere picking it up. And under Carleton's obsessive prodding, Kit Carson accelerated his scorched earth program. And there's so much more to this account about the Navajo that we're going to have to pick it up tomorrow. But uh, I just want to want to uh, end this by saying that this is something that was ongoing for Kit Carson, for the Navajo, uh, for many years. And uh, although Carson continued this steady destruction of all the grain fields, the beans, the pumpkin patches, he was moving too slowly to suit Carlton. And uh, so Kit Carson accelerated his scorched earth program and by the autumn had destroyed most of the herds and grain that belonged to the Navajo between Fort Canby and Canyon de Chile. And uh, there's more to this. i got to end there. I was looking for a good place to stop it, and that's going to have to be it. Uh, So, folks, this is the story of the conquest of the American West. This is the beginning. We're going to hit this more tomorrow. Sit tight, and we'll be back in 23 hours.